It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Thanks for listening to another episode. Paul's New Testament letter to the Romans is one of the most important Christian writings ever recorded. The passage of time has obscured the letter's original context, not to mention the language it's been rendered in from its original Greek to the more archaic King James English. The letter can make it difficult for readers today to appreciate the logic of Paul's testimony of Jesus. Latter-day Saint philosopher Adam Miller believes Romans and its emphasis on grace is perhaps the best articulation of the gospel of Christ found in the Bible. So as a follow-up to his recent best-selling book, Letters to a Young Mormon, Miller published a personal rendition of Romans called Grace is Not God's Backup Plan, an urgent paraphrase of Paul's letter to the Romans. So in this episode, Miller talks about why he created his own rendition of the text. We'll read from it and compare some passages to the King James Version passages. And we'll also discuss the most recent Mormon theology seminar, which Adam co-directed at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And please take a moment to rate and review the show in iTunes and share it with your friends. Adam Miller, welcome back to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thanks. Yeah, we're talking about a book you just released. Uh, The book is called Grace is Not God's Backup Plan, an urgent paraphrase of Paul's letter to the Romans. And uh, you start the book off in the introduction with kind of a provocative line that I'm sure nitpickers will love to unpack. You say, the book of Romans is a rare thing in religion, an explanation. So go ahead and unpack that a little bit. Well, I think think that's just straightforwardly true. I mean, you get... uh... Over the course of thousands of pages of scripture, you get a lot of stories, you get a lot of history, you get a lot of parables, uh, you get some prophecies, uh, you get some poetry, you get some psalms, uh, you get the occasional sermon, uh, but you never get any kind of uh, extended, clear, uh, logically precise account of how the big pieces of the Christian story are supposed to fit together. I think we kind of take for granted 2,000 years uh, later, we, as Christians, we kind of take for granted the fact that the whole of the story does hang together in a particular way. But I think uh, on the basis of scriptures themselves, both biblical and Mormon, a lot of how those pieces are fit together is not always obvious from the texts themselves. Okay, so in the Book of Mormon, you'll have occasional sermons where um, King Benjamin, for example, kind of lays out how they're going to become the children of Christ and, and walks them through that. Or the Savior uh, in Third Nephi 11 will walk through what we now know as the Beatitudes and, and lay out the uh, essential elements of the gospel. And you're saying Paul is a little bit different because, number one, he's it's a lot longer, it's more sustained, and number two, maybe the style of uh, of what he's doing sets it apart, like he's using reason, he's, he's kind of laying out a logical case? Yeah, I think Romans uh, is not only unique, I think, across the whole of Scripture, but it's even unique in relationship to the rest of Paul's epistles. Uh, because this letter is a, re- is a letter that, number one, Paul writes relatively late in his life, so he's had a lot of time to, to think about and chew over uh, and try out different ways of explaining what the gospel is. Uh, but number two, this is a this is a letter that he is writing uh, to the people in Rome who he has never met. Mm-hmm. And so he is attempting, for their sake, to kind of lay out piece by piece from the ground up uh, exactly what the gospel is. And he goes to great pains to show how those pieces fit together. Yeah, and sometimes it's difficult, especially for me, when I'm reading the King James Version, it can be difficult to make sense of those pieces. Uh, the King James, uh, it can be very poetic, and, 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 and I like the language of it generally, but sometimes um, the age of the language can obscure it for me. And Paul himself has a distinctive style, and even when you read different translations of Paul, I think 
people get the sense that he's writing in a different vein here uh, than a lot of other scripture authors. So maybe talk for a second about Paul's style and the problem of translating scripture into different languages and the kind of stylistic issues that come up. Uh, well, I think you're right. We have a kind of uh, – there are kind of two sets of obstacles that exist for us as we try to understand Paul. And one is uh, to familiarize ourselves enough with Paul's world and uh, way of speaking that uh, that can make sense for us. But the other obstacle, too, is the obstacle uh, that we face given that, that we're reading Paul not just in a, a translation – of the original Greek, but we're reading Paul in a translation that is itself hundreds of years old, right? We're reading it typically as Mormons uh, in the King James version. And as you pointed out, the the King James version, uh, the King James rendering of Paul's letter to the Romans is uh, phenomenally beautiful, stunningly beautiful, and uh, consistently opaque to the point that you often can't tell what is being said at all, let alone how the pieces fit together. There, there may be no book of Scripture uh, in all of Scripture that suffers more uh, in terms of its coherence uh, in the King James translation than the book of Romans. One of the things you mentioned in your introduction is, uh, here's a quote from you, we need our renderings of scripture to do more than mimic the original. We need them to bleed and breathe. So talk a little bit about your process of doing this book, because it's not a strict translation, and talk about what you meant by needing renderings to bleed and breathe. We don't usually think personify texts that way. Uh, well, as you point out, uh, this isn't a kind of literal word-for-word -word translation of Paul's letter to the Romans. It is, as the subtitle describes it, a kind of paraphrase of Paul's letter. Uh, it occurred to me when I first started working on this book that uh, if I were to give myself a kind of freer hand – in terms of how I rendered things at the level of word-for-word uh, -word translations uh, of Paul's text, if I were to give myself a freer hand there, then I would be in a position to be more faithful to uh, making clear the elements of the argument that Paul is making. I think a lot of times, uh, even contemporary, even good contemporary translations of Paul's letter to the Romans uh, get hamstrung by their fidelity to the details uh, of exactly what's involved in translating Paul's letter at the level of the word. And this gets in the way of, of making clear how all the, the big picture elements of Paul's uh, account of the gospel fit together. Yeah, so as far as bleeding and breathing are concerned, how does your approach bring out that kind of element? Well, this is the other thing I think. Uh, you have to uh, – in rendering what Paul says, you have to pay, on the, pay attention on the one hand to uh, just what Paul's saying in terms of his language, in terms of the words, in terms of uh, uh, the logic of the argument. But on the other hand, you have to pay attention to uh, the experience that is at the root of what Paul is trying to describe. And if you ignore if you ignore the way that uh, uh, Christian experience itself informs the logic that Paul is attempting to put together for us here in his explanation of the gospel, then you you end up missing what Paul's after anyway. I think another thing is just the force of particular metaphors in any given culture. I, in an interview I did with Lauren Winner yeah. uh, a couple episodes ago, she was talking about how Jesus taught using parables, and his parables were always informed by things that Jesus would encounter on an, on a regular Tuesday uh, or Wednesday. You know, yeah. uh, casting seed alongside of the roads and, and you know uh, that that sort of thing. And and it seems like um, the further people are from those contexts, the less power those parables can potentially have. And so it seems like uh, the same kind of thing happens with Paul, where you're you're kind of introducing his logic and thought into a more contemporary idiom, into a more contemporary, I want to say the word social imaginary, you know, the Charles Taylor thing, where you're, yeah. bring, you're bringing it into uh, a picture of life and of the world that maybe more quickly resonates with, with people. 
Yeah, so uh, that's exactly right. So on the one hand, I wanted to pay close attention to the letter of Paul's text. But on the other hand, I wanted that attention to be informed by uh, paying really close attention to the kind of life that Paul was trying to describe. And if, if that life doesn't end up uh, informing how we render the letter, then there's not much point in rendering the letter anyway. Yeah, there's like a linguistic rendering and there's a maybe like a life world rendering. There's deep, yeah, there's certain... kind of existential rendering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> phenomenological <laughs> rendering. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, now, the question I had, I, I don't remember seeing this uh, addressed, was if you made use of the Greek, did, did you actually go back to the original languages or what did you use as your sources to put this paraphrase together? Uh, I am a professor of philosophy. My training is in philosophy. But I passed uh, language exams in uh, both Greek and French as part of my doctoral work. I wrote my dissertation on uh, Paul and on, on this epistle to the Romans and the way that uh, Paul's uh, work gets taken up in con contemporary European philosophy. So I've been working with uh, this text uh, in a kind of non-Mormon setting professionally for about a decade now. And when I went back to work on this particular little paraphrase, uh, I did it with kind of with three texts open all before me at the same time. I had on the one hand, I had the King James Version. Uh, on the other hand, I also had a, a nice, clean, contemporary translation done by uh, N.T. Wright, who's uh, maybe the eminent scholar of, of Christian scripture alive on the planet today. It's a beautiful translation. And uh, the Greek text as well. And so I, uh, I consulted all three as I went about freely paraphrasing my own version. All right, so that gives us a general idea of how you worked. I want to maybe expand a little bit on something you just talked about. So as a philosopher, you focused on Paul and your own philosophical work. And for people who believe that ac the academic world doesn't have a lot of space for religious thought or the idea that that uh, secularism crowds out uh, religious thought, scripture, belief, and, and these types of things. Uh, talk about that in context of your own experience because it's not just you who's taken up Paul, but Paul seems to be a popular figure uh, in the academy for uh, maybe a surprising range of, of philosophers. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think one of the things that's been helpful for me is that to the degree that the academy is secular and a lot of the contemporary thinkers who are interested in Paul are, are not religious. Right? For instance, I wrote my dissertation in part about uh, Alain Badiou, a contemporary French thinker who is uh, uh, without a doubt uh, an atheist, but nonetheless very interested in Paul. Right? But, because, uh, but because a lot of the interest in Paul uh, – comes from people who uh, are looking at him from outside of a religious context, that uh, makes it easier in some ways for me looking at Paul from within a religious context to see those elements of Paul that speak directly to a kind of uh, to universal dimensions of human experience that are shared by everyone regardless of whether you're religious or not. And I think that it's often the case that uh, when we try to think about religious ideas, the most important elements of those religious ideas uh, are elements that are not themselves uniquely religious. Now, before we um, dig into the actual text, here's another quote from your introduction, and this kind of will give people a general sense of the, the main message that you, that you uh, find in Paul and that you present in your rendition. You say, it's my argument that the deep logic of Romans comes into sharp focus around a single premise, Paul's claim that grace is not God's backup plan. And that's your book's title as well, of course, and it's really striking. So we'll talk about your actual articulation of grace in a second, but I was wondering if you remembered what you were doing when that particular line came to you, because it's really catchy and uh, it's a nice little uh, bullet point. So do you remember how that came to you? Um, well, the title itself came to me as most everything decent that I write does. It came to me while I was running in the morning. Uh, though, uh, if I remember right, some version of that phrase shows up uh, in the first book that I published that was based on my dissertation. Uh, 
that involved in part a reading of the letter to the Romans. So I think that that some version of that phrase goes back a long way for me, a good ten years now, that maybe didn't have quite this quite this form. So the book is Grace is Not God's Backup Plan. We're speaking today with Adam Miller. His other books include Rube Goldberg Machine's Essays in Mormon Theology and, uh, of course, the book that the Maxwell Institute published, Letters to a Young Mormon, uh, which is one of uh, the best-selling titles that we've ever produced here. Um, Adam's also a professor of philosophy at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. Uh, Adam, let's turn to the actual text now and talk about grace and go over some of your own rendition here to give people a sense of what you've done. So I, I've got the King James text here that I'm going to read, and uh, let's go to Romans chapter 1, just begin at the beginning. And uh, I'll read through the King James, and then I'll have you read your rendering so people can get a sense for um, how the language compares and that sort of thing. So this is Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. I'll read the King James, and then you can read your rendition. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, so that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, go ahead and, and read yours there. And a, and a lot of that in the Greek uh, essentially unfolds as a single sentence. Yeah, which, which is, is uh, practically impossible in English. Sort of the David Foster Wallace of the scriptures, the interminable sentence. Yeah, well, I mean, Greek lends itself to that kind of thing in a way that English uh, doesn't too. Right. Uh, one thing, let me say one thing about yeah. my own rendition is that the rendition involves uh, paraphrasing rather than rendering things word for word. Uh, but two, I also, uh, in order to kind of, in order to foreground uh, the logic of what Paul was saying and how the pieces fit together, uh, I sometimes, in my paraphrase, either uh, shortened elements of uh, the original text or slightly expanded elements of the original text. So there's that to consider. Okay, yeah, good. It's not word for word. Some things I uh, clipped, I cut <laughs> and shortened. Some things I expanded for the sake of, always for the sake of clarifying the logic of what he was after. So with that in mind, uh, go ahead and uh, give your rendition there from Romans chapter 1. Okay. A letter from Paul to those living at the heart of empire. I am bound to Jesus, my rescuer. He called me to him. He sent me to you. He sifted me with God's good news. From the beginning, God promised to rescue us, and this promise was announced and written down and repeated by many people all over the world for a long time. Jesus is the living embodiment of this promise because he is flesh and blood, descended from great and terrible men, and still he was named as God's son through a spirit that reached out and snatched him back from the dead. This same spirit claimed me and then sent me to you. I've been sent to encourage your trust in the promise Jesus embodies and to embolden you to submit to his troubles. You too, regardless of your flesh, regardless of your weakness and ignorance, are called to bind yourself to Jesus. So to all of you loved by God, and thus to all of you called to discover what it means to be both human and holy, I wish grace and peace from God our Father and from Jesus, my rescuer to whom I am bound. All right, so maybe first talk about that, that binding element that you bring up. I'm bound to Jesus. Um, Paul, of course, begins, uh, uh, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So talk about your uh, notion of binding that you introduce. Uh, well, it shows up in two different ways. Uh, in my translation, and always in the back of my mind uh, as I'm using this language, uh, always in the back of my mind as a Mormon, is the language of sealing, mm -hmm. sealing and binding. Uh, but the word, the, this construction being bound uh, to Jesus, being bound to God, shows up two ways in the text. On the one hand, it can be uh, a translation of Paul's use of the word Lord, mm 
uh, because your Lord is the one to whom you are bound, right? Uh, in fact, for Paul, right, Paul describes himself as as a servant, a of servant, Jesus, right? Or uh, a better, a, probably a better translation of what's going on there in the Greek, right? The Greek word is doulos, uh, as a slave. He's mm-hmm. a slave. Paul is saying of Jesus Christ. And so this is, in part, this is my attempt to render that, right? What does it mean to be a slave to Jesus? Uh, it means uh, that you are bound to him. He is your Lord. Uh, but the other, the other way that that phrase shows up consistently in my translation is, uh, is that it translates, in part, uh, Paul's key theological term, which has kind of driven theologians and translators mad over the millennia trying to to translate and that word in greek is uh dikaiosune which is uh has to do with the righteousness of god or with the justification right god right. justifying us in relationship to him uh, and part of what the part of what i mean to capture in my translation of uh dikaiosune is uh the way that at the root of god's righteousness and his attempt to righteousify us uh, is a kind of covenant faithfulness, is God's being bound to us. That's what it means for God to be righteous, and this is what he wants uh, in terms of righteousness. To, to be made right with God is to be set in relationship to him in such a way that we are bound together. Yeah, uh, And this is something that N.T. Wright in his uh, contemporary translation of uh, Paul's letter makes really plain. He always translates the Kaiosune as uh, covenant faithfulness. And I think that's that catches the flavor of what is uh, what Paul's after. Yeah, it's an interesting interpretive choice too, ba- because it takes into consideration the fact that words connote different things to different audiences. So a lot of minds would go to more contemporary uh, instances of slavery, and so you kind of do away with that um, that partic- p- the potential to follow that tr- uh, train of thought by introducing this idea of being bound. So I, I think that's kind of exemplary of some of the rendition decisions that are made where you're taking into account the fact that these words are going to connote particular things to particular audiences and and how mindful of that were you throughout the process i was very mindful of trying to render paul's argument in a very brisk and contemporary idiom uh and giving it as a kind of paraphrase i think I, i just gave myself license to do it yeah. Well, with like with with like slavery, though, like some people would say, hey, I'm going to be so brisk. I'm going to make this so stark that I'm just going to say it. It'll it'll be a little shocking because you could use that slavery metaphor to shock or to draw attention as well. So you could have started it off. You started off by saying a letter from Paul to those living at the heart of empire. You could have started off by saying Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. And I think that's that's not a bad that's not a bad rendition. Right. I mean, that's uh, what the text says, right? Yeah. And even even at a kind of existential level, it's not a bad rendition, I don't think. But, I mean, I was uh, – my decision there, for instance, is informed, as a lot of the decisions were, is informed by how I was going to uh, – I was going to – uh, it was informed by how I saw Paul eventually weaving all of these pieces together into a larger whole. And so given, for instance, that I knew that uh, that binding and sealing were going to be important elements of how I, tra- how I translated the rest of the letter, mm-hmm. right? that in turn influenced how I translated the other parts of the letter. Yeah, yeah, good, good. That's really good. Um, so um, let's move on to another example. It's, it's in the same chapter, actually, and it's where we're where it discusses the concept of sin. And I think this is one of the most important sections. It's good that the letter starts out this way because it seems to be a really important um, signpost in the way that you interpret Paul in your rendition. So I'm going to read uh, verses 16 through 23 of Romans 1, and then you can pick up there uh, on page 14. Um, So here it is from Romans chapter 1. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shewed it unto them. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. All right, so uh, there are a lot of ideas in this brief section. You tend to focus on trust, sin, and grace. So go ahead and uh, read your rendition of that. I'm glad to finally be sent to you. I'm not ashamed of the good news I bear. It's the only thing that saved me from sleepwalking through my own life, broken-hearted and dead to the world. God's promise is powerful, and its power to rescue extends both to insiders and outsiders. God doesn't care what you are. Without waiting for you or checking your credentials, God has already bound himself to you. God's power to make things right is revealed when his trust meets your trust. As many have said for a long time, those who are set right and sealed to God are brought back to life by their trust. But if your trust fails and you suppress the truth, God's love will start to feel like an accusation. If, selfish and weak, you try to run from life and its troubles, you'll feel trapped and smothered by the gifts God is giving. Sin is this too proud denial of God's grace. It's this refusal to be sealed to God. Grace isn't God's improvised response to sin. Sin is our ongoing refusal of God's already given grace. Even for the selfish and weak, even without any supernatural epiphanies, what can be known about God and the life he offers is clear. It's been plain from the beginning. There's no mystery here. What it means to be alive is obvious. God's power and glory are already on display. Deny it if you want. But if you see what's given and then fail to respond to that grace with grace of your own, your mind will go dark. You won't be able to think straight and you'll get stuck in your own head, left to cook in your own fears and fantasies. Claiming to be wise, you'll be an idiot. You'll have exchanged a life pulsing with spirit for a wishful menagerie of dead things and dying applause. Okay, the first thing I'd like to point out here is um, Paul talks about the wrath of God being revealed in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed. And so as I'm going through here, obviously, I, I don't see the word wrath. I do um, – I think uh, I tried to find a place where you kind of incorporated that idea, and it's and it seemed to be in your uh, paragraph there. There, there. Are, by the way, there are verse markings in your margins that kind of let readers know ab about where you're at. So mm -hmm. in the margin there next to 18, uh, it's where you talk about if your trust fails and you suppress the truth, God's love will start to feel like an accusation. Is was that kind of where that idea was incorporated, or something else? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, accusation there. God's love feeling like an accusation. Uh, that's what I think Paul's after there with, with the wrath of God. Uh, what happens is when when you and I, when we attempt, as Paul puts it, when we attempt to suppress God's love and grace, then that distorts how his love looks to us. And his gestures of love, the gestures of love and grace that he's making toward us because we're trying to suppress those gestures, they end up looking to us like accusations, right? They end up looking like he's angry when he's actually trying to reach out and, uh, and love us. Yeah, and you connect this to the idea of sin. And actually, um, there's a chapter in Letters to a Young Mormon called Sin. And I, I believe it's actually – that chapter is available on the Maxwell Institute website, so people can read that as a sample chapter. And this is a chapter that people bring up to me a lot whenever I talk to them about this book um, – to do a little buzz marketing for Letters to a Young Mormon. So when I talk to people about Letters to a Young Mormon, they bring up this chapter. It's a really tough one to wrap their minds around because we're used to talking about sin as a bad, a bad action, a bad decision, a bad choice, breaking a commandment, doing something bad in general. And your approach through Paul seems to widen that definition. So maybe uh, discuss that idea of sin a little bit because it, it, it can be really hard to, to grasp, I think. Like I'm yeah. still working on <laughs> grasping that, so help me out. Well, I think it's I think it's the key to understanding everything else that Paul says in the letter uh, about what grace is, about what sin is, and about what both grace and sin have to do with the law. I mean, I think if if there are three, the whole Paul's this letter to the Romans is organized, I think, around those three ideas. It's organized around the relationship between grace and sin and the law. 
And if we can, and if we can make any sense out of what Paul has to say about the law, it depends on, on, on understanding what he says here, especially in the opening chapter, about the relationship between grace and sin. I think the really key thing here to see about Paul's description of sin uh, is that uh, it reverses the way we normally think about the relationship between grace and sin. Normally we think about sin as this thing that comes first, right? There's a law, you and I break it, and then maybe if we measure up in a certain kind of way, God's grace will come and make up the difference right. such that we can overcome our sinfulness. But Paul totally reverses it here, and I think correctly, the relationship between sin and grace. It's not the case that grace is God's, it's not the case that grace is just God's response to sin. It's, this, it's the case that sin at root is our suppression, our rejection of an original grace that God had, has always already been trying to offer us. And as Paul puts it here, that grace shines through primarily in the creation of the world. The world as a created thing, God's power and glory and grace shine through the world, uh, the created world as a gift that he's trying to give us. And it's our suppression of these gifts that, trying, that God is trying to give us uh, that is sin's most fundamental gesture. And I think this, this parallels in really straightforward ways the kind of things that President Benson had to say about uh, all sin in the end being some version or other of pride. Right? Pride is this rejection of, of God's grace. It's this wanting to, to stand on your own two feet and do it yourself and not have to depend on God and not, not have to receive all these gifts that God is giving that you probably don't even want. Uh, so if we understand sin in this, really, in this really broad, kind of existentially fundamental way as our, uh, our suppression, of the grace that God from the beginning has been trying to give us, uh, then I think that totally reframes uh, not only understand how not only how we understand sin in relationship to grace, but it totally re it totally reframes how we can understand uh, the law in relationship to both grace and sin. Yeah, so it's it's like your your presentation of sin, your rendition of Paul's presentation of sin, uh, puts sin and grace into close contact. And so let's also expand a little bit more on grace. And I think one of the clues that you give uh, about uh, your conception of grace here is that grace is uh, let's see what verse is this in? Um, well, basically that God already loves you, that God's already bound uh, Himself to you. So, uh, and then you say. Um, even without any supernatural epiphanies, uh, what can be known about God and the life he offers is clear. It's plain from the beginning. Uh, all of God's power and glory are on display. See, and Paul is being more specific. He's talking about the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Um, is Paul talking about, is this sort of like a, hey, look around at the world, it's a it's an amazing gift, and every moment is a gift. Is, is that where he's kind of trying to situate grace, or how do you how do you read that? Yeah, I think for Paul, the most fundamental manifestation of God's grace is in the act of creation itself, and it's our it's our refusal, on the one hand, of at least in part the created world, and maybe even more particularly on the other hand of our own createdness of our own dependence on that world and on God. Uh, it's our rejection of that dependence that defines what sin is. So I think what Paul gives us here, we could say, what Paul gives us is a kind of general theory of grace. Uh, normally when we think about grace, we, we think about it only in very narrow kind of specialized terms. And we think, we think about grace only insofar as grace intervenes yeah. in our experience of redemption. Grace equals forgiveness, basically. Right. Grace, yeah. yeah, grace equals forgiveness. Uh, and it equals forgiveness in connection with maybe some uh, contribution of our own, right? Such that right, right. Works plus yep. a, a certain amount of works plus a certain amount of grace will uh, output a certain amount of forgiveness. And, that's, and God uh, still wins because like he he's initially gives that opportunity – before you even do anything, right? So you can even, the grace versus works, and then you can say there's even grace before that, but you have to tap into that and that sort of a thing. But it's always about um, 
repenting or reconciling. Right. Yeah. But I think if we if we only understand if we only understand uh, grace in this very specialized way in the context of redemption, if we don't see grace as a description of God's uh, general mo in terms of how he <laughs> operates in relationship to the world, uh, then we'll miss the way that grace isn't something that intervenes at the end to save us, but the grace is the thing that came at the beginning that we are that we rejected. Uh, that was that, that, that is the root of the sinfulness that we're trying to overcome. So it's not so much the case, for instance, that you and I have to put ourselves in a position to uh, to receive some kind of grace that might come in the might come at the end of our story, but it's the case that because sin is a suppression of the grace that God is already giving, uh, my overcoming that my sinfulness just involves my laying down my rebellious uh, rejection of the grace that's already being offered. Yeah, it's so it's almost like, um, I guess another way to put it would be God's grace includes forgiveness. God's yes. grace, that's one facet, that's one expression of that grace, but that expression of grace can be understood to be part of a wider type of grace that includes God's care for us, the creation that, that he's... Uh, his creation, us as children, us in relationship to him, the gifts that are given, um, and, and that – so grace kind of is that bigger picture that's driven toward binding relationships, and any relationship requires forgiveness. Like, And so forgiveness and redemption is part of that overall picture of grace, but that's because – Forgiveness and redemption is part of any kind of loving bond. Yeah, I think this is this is the kind of thing that Elder McConkie is after, for instance, when he says uh, that if you want to understand the plan of salvation, you have to understand the three pillars of eternity. Yeah. Right, and the three pillars of eternity are creation, fall, and atonement. atonement. And the way that he explains it, right, you can't understand you can't understand the atonement if you don't understand the fall. And you can't understand the fall if you don't understand creation. And the reason that you can't understand the fall if you don't understand creation is because uh, the fall, uh, our falling into sinfulness, uh, depends on our rejection of that original grace manifest in creation itself. It's grace, sin, grace, right? Creation, right. fall, atonement. Uh, grace isn't the backup plan here that intervenes at the end of the story to make things work out. Uh, grace is the plan from the beginning. It is from beginning to end uh, a description of the way that that God, in, in terms of love, is uh, interacting with the world and with us. It's, it's what he wants to share with us, and it's what he wants us to become capable of. Mm-hmm. It's grace all the way down, right? Yeah. If it's, tur- if it's turtles all the way, if turtles are grace, it's grace all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> Another uh, part of this that stuck out to me is uh, in verse 16, where Paul says that um, the power of God unto salvation is given to everyone that believeth, to Jew first and also to the Greek. And you uh, replace Jew and Greek with insider and outsider. Uh, and this is throughout the letter because Paul continues to talk about Gentiles and Jews. And uh, so talk about the decision to replace that with insider-outsider. Yeah, that's maybe uh, the second basic uh, translation decision I had to make in rendering the letter was how I was going to render Paul's uh, discussion of the relationship between the Jew and the Gentile. Uh, And I render Jew throughout the letter. Whenever Paul says Jew, I render it as insider, like the religious insider, and I render Greek as outsider, like the religious outsider. Um, And I think that stays true to most of what Paul is after uh, in his own letter in terms of what he has to say about the relationship between the Jew and the Greek, uh, between the Jew and the Gentile. But I think it also makes it possible for us to read the letter in a different way than we normally do. Because normally when we read what Paul has to say about the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, we identify with the Gentiles, that is to say, with the religious outsiders. Uh, but I think it's a lot more accurate when we're reading Paul's letter to uh, to identify ourselves with uh, 
with the position occupied by the Jews, right, with the religious insiders. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as Mormons, uh, we understand ourselves as religious insiders, as people with a kind of inside track on God's revelations, on uh, uh, access to priesthood authority, things like this, right? Uh, and that's what Paul has in mind. What Paul has in mind in his entire discussion of relationship between the between the Jews and the Gentiles is the way that God's grace uh, confounds and reorganizes our normal the the lines that we normally draw between people who are religious and people who aren't. Yeah, that the that the line between the saved and the unsaved. Does not is not the same thing as the line between the religious and the non-religious. It's not the same thing as the line between the insider and the outsider. Mm -hmm. The line between those who have received God's grace and those who haven't cuts diagonally across that typical religious distinction. That's that's one of Paul's most basic points he wants to make about grace. And I think it's a little hard for us to get our heads around it when we just render it as Jew and Gentile, and especially when we identify ourselves with the outsiders rather than the insiders. Yeah, I think chapter Romans chapter 9 is where he really, um, really unpacks this because he brings up specific ideas of adoption and covenants and priesthood, law, ordinances. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, um, in your rendition of this, and this is on page 47, uh, Romans 9, uh, where God entrusted these things, adoption, glory, covenants, priesthood, law, ordinances, God entrusted them to insiders. He entrusted these to Israel. Um, but they failed to trust God in return, denying God's grace. They faltered. Not all insiders are willing to live by grace. And there, there's also a little bit later on, page 48, uh, this would be Romans 9, verse 8-ish. Uh, being an insider isn't enough to make you part of the covenant family. Pedigrees and good manners and respectable clothes and properly signed documents aren't enough. Only a willingness to trust God's promise can make you Abraham's seed. This reminded me of Jesus' declaration that, uh, or was it John the Baptist, uh, who said God can raise up from these stones the seed of Abraham. So do you think Paul is sort of drawing on that same type of idea when he's talking about the insiders and outsiders? Well, I think it brings us right to the doorstep of that third term that's central to the letter to the Romans, right? We've talked a little bit about grace and we've talked a little bit about sin. But the other thing that Paul wants to explain is the relationship between the law and sin and mm -hmm. grace. And one of the basic points that he makes about the law, and I think this is one of the things that's, uh, that's typically really hard for us to get our heads around uh, as Mormons, one of the basic thing, one of the basic points he makes about the law, is that uh, sure it's entirely possible to sin by breaking the law, but you can also totally sin. It's also totally possible to sin by keeping the law. Mm -hmm. Right? You can keep the law in a way that's sinful. Yeah. Uh, based on its effect, based on its the way like we talked about grace earlier, based on its effect on that overall relationship between you and God and the world. Right. The difference between the two is grace. Uh, you, if you keep the law in a way that denies grace, then you're still keeping the law. Then you're keeping the law mm -hmm. in a way that is itself sinful. Right. You can break the law in a way that denies grace, but you can also keep the law in a way that denies grace. Right. In which case, being a religious insider who has the law doesn't do you any good because the law is just giving you a new way, a religious way to be a sinner. Right. In fact, it can make it harder for you to change because, because you think you don't need to. Because you think you don't need to, yeah. right? You think you're already doing what it was that the law intended you to accomplish. Yeah. But the point of the law is not obedience. The point of the law is love and grace. Uh, and if you're using the law to deny God's grace, uh, then uh, you're frustrating the whole point of the law itself. This is such a big deal for Paul, especially because of who he was, a transitional figure as Christianity. So huge, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Christianity is differentiating itself from Judaism. Uh, Jesus was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. Uh, early converts were Jews. And they're trying to reckon with this relationship between the gospel of Christ and this law that's got this very distinguished pedigree. <laughs> and, uh, man, it's just, it seems to be just, this is at the core of the, of a transition between Judaism and Christianity, it seems. Yeah, and I think it's 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 at the core of religious experience itself, because religious experience organizes itself around the law, and whether or not religious experience ends up connecting us to God or disconnecting us from God, 
doesn't depend on whether it's religious. It depends on how, as religious people, we relate to the law. Right. So that kind of covers sin, grace, and law, these three uh, large themes. The other one, I think, the other theme that I would add to that list is just the practical application. Because Paul has laid out these big ideas and these general principles in, in a way that's a little countercultural, and, and he's trying to bring his listeners around to this new view of the gospel, which I think also has some really great and interesting roots in Judaism. It's not, it wasn't the fact that it just completely overthrew um, the law. In many ways, it was a return to maybe the original purposes for the law. No, it's an, yeah, it's an, yeah. as Jesus puts it, it's an yeah. attempt to fulfill the law. Right, right. Uh, and then we get to Romans chapter 12, and this is when Paul gets really specific. So he's talking about actual real-life applications of these principles he's explaining. So um, I'm going to read the King James Version, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, and then uh, this is on page 61 of your paraphrase, and then I'll have you uh, read your rendition. So here is Romans 12, verses 1 through 5. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. This is a tongue twister. <laughs> mm-hmm. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. All right, uh, go ahead with yours. Yeah, uh, maybe before I read that, let me just say one thing about sure. the Paul being kind of countercultural. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think that Paul is. Uh, the interesting thing about Paul is the way that he's always working diagonally in relationship to that, to those cultural distinctions that define the Jew and define the Greek, so that he's always, he's always frustrating the Jews with the way that he talks about things, and he's also always frustrating the Gentiles with the way that he talks about things. So if you can imagine someone in contemporary discourse who, whatever he says, uh, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats like it, yeah. then you get a feel right for what Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what Paul is doing right. He's countercultural in that sense. All right, sorry. So here's the here's the passage from Romans twelve. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Consecrate your lives. Worship God by answering his gift with a gift of your own. This isn't easy. Don't let the demands of a sinful world deform you. Be transfigured by God's willingness to free your mind from distraction and addiction. Don't think of yourself as special or heroic. Be sober and pay close attention. Be the kind of earthy, hard-nosed realist your faith in God demands. It's true that you belong to the body of Christ, and that's a great thing. But it's also true that cut off from it, you'd die. All the parts need all the others. Each part has a different job. Despite our differences, God's grace binds us together. So, So this body of Christ discussion is captivating it and i think um this is even more clear in in other sections of the rendition but here where you've talked about insiders and outsiders uh, where paul has jews and gentiles and then you introduce this idea of even the insiders that there's variety within insiders and 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 i don't know that you know that paul paul might extend the metaphor of the body of christ to include people that were beyond the church um yes i think so i don't the body of christ here is not uh coextensive with with the insiders. Yeah, so talk about that because he's – it seems like this is a continuation of that resistance, the diagonal line cut across that you talked about, right? Mm-hmm. Right, so the body of Christ consists of everyone uh, through whom the blood of grace flows. I mean that's what it means to belong to the body of Christ. And as Paul points out early in the letter, it's possible without even knowing anything about God's law or revelations – it's possible to live in such a way that that grace flows through you. And, and the body of Christ, uh, in a sense, then it, it transcends those traditional religious distinctions between insider or outsider or 
covenant people or, or non-covenant people. As Paul is at great pains to explain, that doesn't mean it's not important to be part of the covenant people. Right. Uh, he's, he <laughs> comes back to that point again and again why it's still important to be part of the covenant people. But he also wants, uh, without any compromise, uh, to hold the position that the body of Christ is not limited to the covenant people. Yeah, it's all part of why why Romans is just such a tricky book of scripture, such a tricky thing for Paul to pull off, uh, yeah. be, be, because it simultaneously wants to reaffirm the importance of the body of faith, the community that most people associate with the faithful, but also to, so that community uh, is important. But he's also saying, you know, it's not important. <laughs> so he's kind of yeah. Well, to... I mean, he wants to, he wants to reaffirm the importance of being part of the covenant people, offer a scathing critique of the covenant people. Yeah. And uh, describe how it's possible for those who are not part of the covenant, nonetheless, to be uh, included in the body of Christ. Yeah, it's a tough, man, what a tough job that he had. I think this is one of the things that makes Romans such a standout in the New Testament and, and in probably all uh, all scripture, This, all of these tensions. P- Paul seems to just get right to the core tensions that exist. And so I can, it can be tough to chew on, but I think the paraphrase here, uh, really helps people do that. So I think people should pick that up. This is The book is called Grace is Not God's Backup Plan, an urgent paraphrase of Paul's letter to the Romans by Adam Miller. You can pick up a copy of that on Amazon. Um, now, one other question about this book in particular before we move on. W- was there anything as you did this rendering that, that struck you uh, in a new way? Did, as you did this process, you had to pay close attention to the text. So were there any new things that you discovered that were surprising, or uh, did a lot of it kind of grow out of things you'd already worked on uh, in your graduate work and in your own personal study? Um, to a large degree, this paraphrase arrived fully formed <laughs> for, for me because, I mean, I, I produced the whole thing. And, I mean, I produced the whole thing in a matter of two or three weeks, really. Uh, and it arrives fully formed, not because I'm some kind of genius or because uh, uh, some uh, revelatory muse was involved, uh, but because I had been thinking about Romans and exactly the issues involved in Romans as a professional philosopher for the past 10 years. Yeah. Right. So I, I've been thinking about and chewing on and writing about and publishing about these things, especially in non-Mormon venues uh, for a decade. And uh, when I got to the point where I w- decided to take a shot at offering my own paraphrase, uh, the thing was already pretty much fully formed. Uh, when did you finally decide to do it? Was there, and, and, and kind of what led to that decision? What made you think like, oh, this this would be a good project? What was the goal here? Other than crass, uh, monetary, uh, <laughs> personal, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm raking in the money here in, yes. the, in the three digits at least. <laughs> uh, no, the impetus was very clear. We were... As a family, for a family scripture study, we were reading uh, N.T. Wright's translation of Romans. Yeah, and that's called the New, the Kingdom New Testament is the yeah, one you keep referring right. to, it's right? Yeah, the Kingdom New Testament, and it's, I highly recommend that yeah, yeah. translation. Uh, but we were reading it together as a family, and the kids were just having a blast yeah. reading Paul, especially because they especially loved uh, Paul's tendency to ask rhetorical questions and then respond in really aggressive ways to his own <laughs> questions, right? They, they had a lot of fun reading that out loud, like where Paul will ask something like, uh, does that mean that we should go on sinning because God's grace is already available? God forbid, certainly not. <laughs> right? And the kids just had a blast with this. And I thought, well, you know, I thought to myself as we were reading as a, as a family, uh, you know, N.T. Wright's uh, version makes so many things so much clearer than they are uh, in our very old but very beautiful King James tr- translation. But I kept thinking to myself, there were so many uh, points in the text where I thought to myself, uh, with a little freer hand, you could make much clearer yeah. why Paul was saying what he was saying uh, and how the pieces fit together into a bigger picture. 
And I thought, well, why don't I just do it then? Yeah, because you have the luxury. Like with N.T. Wright, he did he did want to maintain more close fidelity to the text in terms of keeping it as a more proper translation than, than what you do. And your your idea was, hey, it would be nice to have a tool that kind of trimmed away some of the stuff that maybe the, the kids or even myself would um, kind of be like, okay, let's move on to the next idea. It kind of trimmed some of that stuff away to get to what you understand to be the crux of it and, and put that in people's hands. Yeah, I think – I mean N.T. Wright is constrained by the need to be respectable uh, and rigorous in a way that I was not. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> so you got to be more foolhardy uh, than – that's right. And N.T. Wright, excellent. So that's Adam Miller. Uh, we're talking about his new book, Grace is Not God's Backup Plan, an urgent paraphrase of Paul's letter to the Romans. He's also author of several books, including Buzz Marketing, the Maxwell Institute's Letters to a Young Mormon, as well as Rube Goldberg Machines, a collection of essays on Mormon theology. Uh, and that one's a little bit that, – that one has some pieces in it that are uh, a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, that's like the Adam Miller graduate school book. So um, – Letters to Young Mormon, Great Not God's Backup Plan, and uh, Rube Goldberg Machines round out your Mormon offerings. And then, you've, as you said, you've also done some books uh, with with other presses, right? Um, Speculative Grace is one of those books. Mm -hmm. uh, Speculative Grace. I have a book forthcoming called uh, The Gospel According to David Foster Wallace. My first book was called uh, Bed You, Marion, and St. Paul, Eminent Grace. You can, kind of, you can see a kind of theme. <laughs> Yeah, a lot in of my oeuvre, uh, <laughs> Grace, uh, Grace is straightforwardly uh, the my specialization as a philosopher of religion. I specialize in in thinking about grace. Another place people can go to read more of uh, Adam's work is uh, Times and Seasons, where he's been a blogger for several years now, and also now blogs at By Common Consent as well. So, uh, if you're interested in Adam Miller's work, there's plenty of stuff to dig into, books, blog posts, and other things. Well, we're going to take a quick break right now, and then we're going to come back and talk a little bit about the Mormon Theology Seminar, which uh, the Maxwell Institute started co-sponsoring last year, and which just this year's uh, just wrapped up in New York. So, we'll take a quick break. Be right back. Hey, this is Blair Hodges from the Maxwell Institute podcast. Did you know the Maxwell Institute now offers digital subscriptions to our three periodicals? $10 gets you access to the latest issues of the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, the Mormon Studies Review, and Studies in the Bible and Antiquity. All three for just 10 bucks. Or maybe you're like me and you still love the heft of a journal printed on actual paper. Well, print subscriptions are also available, and a print subscription to any one of our journals includes digital access to all three of them. You can subscribe at our website. Go to maxwellinstitute.byu.edu slash subscribe for more information. It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges, and today I'm talking with Adam Miller. He is author of Grace is Not God's Backup Plan and Letters to a Young Mormon and other books. And he's also a co-director of the Mormon Theology Seminar. Uh, and Adam, you just returned from the Mormon Theology Seminar. That just happened in New York. So let's talk a little bit about what that is, give a little bit of background on it, what it's all, what it's all about. Uh, we just wrapped up uh, our eighth uh, iteration of the Mormon Theology Seminar. Uh, the second live version of the Mormon Theology Seminar and the second one uh, that we could do live because it was co-sponsored by the Maxwell Institute and in particular by the Laura F. Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies. With a little bit of funding there, we were able to uh, do the seminar live, get together for two weeks uh, in New York City. Uh, this year we were hosted by Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Uh, attached to uh, Columbia University. Richard Bushman's old stomping grounds. That's right, Richard Bushman's old stomping grounds, literally like a block and a half uh, from Richard's apartment. Nice. No. <laughs> where that is. Uh, can you give his address and uh, phone number? <laughs> right. uh, just, uh, just right next door to the uh, Riverside Chapel uh, in New York City. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. And uh, the seminary was... Uh, they were an excellent host. We had we had a grand time there. The Mormon Theology Seminar is uh, a project that uh, organizes short 
short-term collaborative readings of narrow slices of Mormon scripture. Uh, and uh, it does this in particular with an eye to the kinds of theological questions that those texts might be able to inform. So it's like, hey, let's take this small group of intelligent people, a short excerpt from the scriptures, and ask particular questions of that text and see what happens when we put all our heads together kind of a thing. Right, exactly. So the uh, the one collection of uh, papers from uh, seminars that have uh, been published thus far by the Maxwell Institute, though there are five or six more in the pipe, uh, is the Alma 32 volume. Yep. Uh, where uh, uh, you get what you do is you get uh, you get six uh, six to eight people together from a variety of disciplines. Uh, and what we did here in New York City was uh, we had we had eight people all together. Joe Spencer and I as the directors of the seminar, and then six other uh, contributors to the seminar. Uh, and the eight of us met for two weeks at Union Theological Seminary, and we spent the we spent the first week. Uh, reading Jacob chapter 7 was our text for this year, uh, where Jacob, the primary content of Jacob chapter 7 is where Jacob confronts Sherem. Yes. About the what the doctrine of Christ means and whether it's good or not <laughs> in relationship to the, in relationship to fulfilling the law of Moses. Um, we spent uh, the first week uh, meeting five hours every afternoon going through that chapter uh, verse by verse, uh, phrase by phrase, word by word. Um, and then the second week of the seminar, uh, we spent writing and workshopping individual papers that grew out of all that collaborative work from the first week and uh, then held a conference uh, to conclude the seminar at the end of the two weeks. So people might say, okay, so is it possible to spend a whole week on one ex? excerpt of scripture like that like what what can possibly be done i mean you read through it and, and that's it so um what kind of yeah yeah, yeah the chapter is like 27 verses long yeah, yeah right <laughs> uh and uh i mean we spent five hours working together in the afternoon and then everyone's mornings uh were spent preparing for the work that we would do together in the afternoon and it does sound it does sound a little wild uh but both this year and last year last year we did first nephi chapter one and we were in London at BYU's uh, London Center last yeah. year. Uh, you know, and I was a little nervous, too. <laughs> this was the first time we'd ever done it. We'd have done it live, right? I mean, will the, will these will these texts hold up to that kind of yeah. intense collaborative scrutiny? And yeah, because previously experience? you're doing it through the internet, right? Like you yeah, so there was, more, there was more time and freedom. The, all the yeah. discussions previously were done online, uh, much less expensive, but a lot less a lot less fun and in some ways less productive. Yeah. But in both cases, both with last year with First Nephi chapter 1 and this year with uh, Jacob chapter 7, we at the end of the week uh, that we spent reading those texts together, everyone in the seminar felt like we'd, we'd barely scratched the surface and we'd left, we'd left so many things untouched. It was a little embarrassing. Yeah, that's kind of – I mean uh, Grant Hardy is here at, at the Maxwell Institute this summer doing a small uh, seminar on the Book of Mormon. It's the same thing. We're focusing on isolated – portions of the text and the class never ends on time and it always ends you know and i'm talking just it goes a couple minute or two over but that's always because the extra minute or two are spent saying oh well we didn't get to this and this and this and you know <laughs> so it's almost like the more attention you pay to it the more questions can be generated and the more i mean the text this is the power of scripture right is this the scripture is generative is that is that a word is that scripture generates thought and the more you put into it the more that seems to grow out of it yeah and i think that's right and i think uh in addition to the kind of uh, really close reading work that Grant specializes in, right, the seminar brings to bear this kind of this kind of additional questions about uh, how the text responds to kind of contemporary theological questions. Uh, you know, it adds this additional kind of philosophical dimension to the work of reading the scripture to ask, all right, if if uh, the text has this and this to say about uh, the doctrine of Christ or the power of the Holy Ghost, if uh, it frames the relationship between uh, the doctrine of Christ and the law of Moses in a certain kind of way, then then what kind of implications does that have for us 
as practicing theologians in the 21st century. Uh, and I think that additional dimension is uh, just adds layers and layers of, of uncompletable work to a project that is already uncompletable. Yeah, and so obviously um, when you do a collaborative seminar like this, it's limited to a, a select number of participants, and we'll talk in a minute about how people can apply to, to become involved in that. But um, the other thing that the seminar uh, does is put out these books of the proceedings. So. Um, people can see what kind of readings resulted from the seminar, and it can prompt further study, further reflection, further ideas. And as you mentioned, the Institute has already published, the Maxwell Institute has already published the volume on Alma 32, which you edited. And I know before the end of the year, we have two more that are uh, going to come out. The first one is uh, Reading Nephi, Reading Isaiah, which is the seminar f when the seminar focused on Second Nephi, where Nephi is reading Isaiah. Uh, and then the second one is Apocalypse, reading Revelation 21 through 22. And I think Julie Smith edited that one, correct? Yes. And then Joseph Spencer and Jenny Webb edited reading Nephi, reading Isaiah. So um, the Alma 32 book's already available. You can pick that one up on Amazon. And then uh, keep an eye on the Maxwell Institute Facebook, Twitter, and blog uh, for news about when those other two books are coming up before the end of the year. So um, Adam, uh, let people know quickly how how they might be able to get involved in the seminar uh, going forward because we, we're going to try to do this each summer so um, what's the general process for being selected to be part of it uh, well at the moment we uh, we are tentatively planning uh, to hold the seminar next summer at the beginning of June in Berkeley California hosted by the Graduate Theological Union there in Berkeley and are tentatively uh, – the, the text that we're uh, tentatively uh, slated to discuss is Alma chapter 13. And in the fall, uh, September, October, probably the, the, probably the beginning of October-ish, uh, we will release a call for applications that will invite uh, scholars to apply uh, to participate in that seminar. Uh, the deadline uh, will probably be the new year, and we would love to get uh, a nice mix of people from a variety of disciplines, both within and without the humanities. We'd like to get a nice mix of both uh, men and women, and we would like to get a nice mix of both um, uh, younger scholars, graduate students, uh, freshly minted PhDs and uh, a, a nice mix of uh, some more mature scholars, more senior scholars. So in this respect, uh, our summer seminar, I think, is different from the summer seminars typically run by uh, Terrell Givens or Richard Bushman mm -hmm. that are limited to graduate students. We'd like to include some graduate students, but uh, this is a seminar that's, uh, uh, that would be happy to also uh, and has included senior scholars as well. Okay, good. So people could just uh, keep an eye on um, the Maxwell Institute website, and also the Mormon Theology Seminar has a website. What's the URL for that? Uh, MormonTheologySeminar.org. So people can check out uh, that for more information as well. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for being on the show today. My pleasure. So that's Adam Miller. He is a co-director of the Mormon Theology Seminar. Um, that is partnered up with the Institute's Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies. Adam's also the author of the new book, Grace is Not God's Backup Plan, an urgent paraphrase of Paul's letter to the Romans. Mm -hmm.